just, you make a comfortable atmosphere. And basically, I was like the overseer. So, in terms of making sure the light bill got paid, that the that whatever needs taxes, whatever needs to get done. We don't produce anything though, so we're, we're not about productivity. We're not trying to sell books and tapes and DVDs. A lot of spiritual communities, they get into, they turn into published, like published publisher's clearinghouse. You know, they've got all this stuff that they think is all the truth and words, and now they got to get it out to as many people as can read, and they end up being all this productivity mentality where they're always pressured, you know, deadlines, to get things published and finished. We're not into producing anything. We really, we really don't produce anything, which gives us the spaciousness to just, a uh, phone call comes in, okay, we can talk about it. Or if it's, if it's something else going on, I'll give you a call back. You know, it's not like these places where you call and you just get an answering machine and you never get a call back. You know, we, we value integrity, we value follow-through, you know, taking the time. Everyone who comes to you is, is yourself, is the Christ coming to you, calling out, you know, for, for love, wanting to connect. So we, we take it very much like that. But you can see without this sense of productivity, without this drive to accomplish something, produce something, achieve something, then if you let go of that, then you have the spaciousness to be present. So when somebody visits, somebody calls on the phone, wants to Skype, you know, there's there's an accessibility there as well. So that's, that's part of that work. But it's very much on guidance. Like now that I've kind of stepped out of the overseer role, I say it's like I'm a, I'm kind of now in orbit. Uh, so I'm in orbit, and then Jason's like handling a lot of all these practical things, uh, donations, bank accounts, bills. Uh, the plumbing breaks down, the roof needs repairing, you know, all the things that would happen if you had a regular household. They still have to be dealt with, but, but everyone's there to use it for mind training, you know, not to turn into a plumber or a carpenter or a book writer or an author or some kind of an, an identity or a concept. That's, that's kind of a glimpse of how it works. It works very well. Jason's loving it too. He's like, wow, this is cool. Like the overseeing, feeling all these prompts coming in, and just letting them come in and come through, and feeling the joy of that without kind of this. You know, both Jason and I have gone through kind of engineering. Did you go through formal training? In engineering. I was in engineering for a year, so more the engineering prototype is analysis. You know, figure it out, apply what you know, and solve it. And in fact, you've had times where where you can't <laughs> fixing that house down in Kentucky. Yeah. Those old ways weren't weren't applicable anymore. You think you know? Okay, you find all the water leaks in the pipes, and you just fix them all, and the water works. The old engineering way would have been: okay, you fix all the leaks in the pipe, and then the pipe is sealed, and it works. Yeah. But I was I I fixed. I thought I fixed all the leaks. <laughs> And I thought, okay, it's time to test it and use the water. But I, I had a little prayer, okay, Holy Spirit, what would you have me do? It's like, leave it, stop for the day, relax, and watch a movie. But the water's working. Today. No, there's a lot more leaks than you think. After you think you've prepared the whole thing, there's a lot more leaks than you think. <laughs> I don't believe you. <laughs> so I go under, get that takes a big ordeal, we go under the house, get the suit on. <laughs> go underneath and turn this water valve, and I turn it on, go back upstairs, <laughs> water pouring in through all the houses, <laughs> everywhere I'm like, and then all this dejection comes in, and like how much more work I had to do, was, but I could have just followed the prompt, had a relaxed evening, watch the movie, start the day fresh, with knowing that I'm going to have more leaks to fix, but no, <laughs> I just go with the old engineering mentality, but that's the point, to wash it away. And, and also, like, I guess, but, like, the, you know, you have had the prompt, so it's like a really good thing. You go, oh, I actually did hear that prompt, but I wasn't yeah. sure that's what it was. Mm -hmm. But my tendency like, would be to go, oh, well, this is kind of begging out. You should have heard the prompt. <laughs> oh, you should have listened to stuff like that. So that just didn't happen today. It's just like, oh, good, you know. And, like, we've got to, like, even, <coughs> even not following the prompt gets used 
as a teaching device for these things. Yeah, we've got to talk, yeah, we've got to join and talk about lots of things and see, you know, that it actually does save you time when you do follow this path. Yeah, you, and you start to realize that you it's just can't right. assume anything, like even with the plumbing thing, there came a point where there was a, a plumber to be contacted who came in and was just a glorious encounter. You know, again, you can't even assume that you're to do things yourself. You may do 70% of a project and then the spirit goes, okay, now that's it for you. Call the plumber, da 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 da. You know, it breaks out of this kind of self-responsibility of the small self where you feel like, well, I can't rely on anybody else. So I guess I'll have to do it all myself. And there's a lot of heaviness and burden. And then pride with accomplishment. Pride with accomplishment. <laughs> I did it all myself. And that all has to get washed away. So frequently, I mean, I at the Peace House one time, this is a house that has upstairs a wood shower. It's a wood shower. So it's had many layers of varnish and shellac and paint and everything on it. But anyway, the plumbing, something went wrong with the plumbing in the wood shower, and so I just thought I would, I would get in there and handle it myself and kind of carve away so I could get into the pipes and everything, and then I uh, had to use a, a blowtorch and just about took the whole <laughs> shower, <laughs> smoked myself <laughs> out of this thing, and then the spirit said, call the plumber. <laughs> I was like, okay, before I burn the house down or whatever. You know, but again, it's kind of like when you just try to have willingness, like, can I do any plumbing? I don't know. Uh, I'm willing. Uh, but the same thing happened with, with websites. I mean, I, when I first, years ago, when I first started following these prompts and going around, I had no cell phone and no computer, didn't use the internet, didn't use email. I just was following my copy up, driving my car, and the Holy Spirit would say, pull over to the phone booth. Yep, the good old fashioned phone booth. I know it's, it's hard to remember. Uh, but then you, you actually, you pull over to a phone booth and then you put whatever it was, a quarter in. Prompt was call so and so. And they say, hey, come on over, this and this. We did it without cell phones and computers and this and that. But, but it, was, it was good practice of just listening and following. And now, even with technology and more conveniences and this and that, it still comes back to good old fashioned listen and follow. And, and do it that way. So that's the, the way that you clear your mind. So this Holy Spirit that used the prompts, I mean, he's just basically a really, really smart guy. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he knows it all. He's a no one. He's a no one. He's a no one. Nothing mysterious at all. Just tell him no at all. It's been very practical. Very practical. And you can't know what practical means. Yeah. I, I was driving to the post office. <laughs> Takes and posts it, you think one guy per car save time, you know, lots of people. Halfway there, I'm like, okay, spirit, my mind, my plan. He's like, no, turn around and go home. I'm like, oh, come on, I can see the post office. <laughs> <laughs> turn around and go home. So I turn around, like, you better have a purpose for this. <laughs> He's like, pick up Russell. I don't know if you guys know Russell, but Russell, you know, helping start a peace house that starts in Australia. He was there. I'm like, oh, okay, I'll go pick up Russell. So I go back and I'm like, but I don't really want to tell him. He has his shoes on, all this stuff. I want to get his post post agenda spirits. Like, he'll be ready. Like, okay. So I go back. I walk in the door and my cell phone starts ringing. And it's Russell on the phone standing at the door calling me. Saying, oh, I was calling you to see if you could pick something up for me. Right as I walked in the door. It's like, oh, I was told to come back and get you. And then you would be ready. So we walked right out to the car. When he got his thing. It was all about communication, to join, work through some stuff. So that's practical. Now the world would say, no, you were almost in the post office, that's impractical to turn around and go back. You see, practicality then becomes listening, following the prompts, and feeling the joy and happiness and peace. That's practical, and everything the world judges practical is out the window. I mean, you really have to be able to be willing to stop what you're doing at any point, you know, to flow with the guidance that comes in. And, and, and why are we telling you these stories about these prompts and this guidance? Is because basically you're not going to go from a deceived state of mind into nirvana or the kingdom of heaven uh, without a transition. Yeah. 
In other words, the mind, when it's into to lies and deception, is too afraid of truth. So it's going to have to have a transition point. The guidance, the prompts we're talking about, are the transition. Because you have to go from listening to the ego, which is all based on past learning, past memories, past associations, to this guidance of the Holy Spirit, which is using the symbols of the world, but, but in a way that will guide you out of the labyrinth, or guide you out of the maze. And so guidance then becomes very, very essential. You know, you, you really need it in order to escape from the world. Because without it, you don't know what's best. You know, you can sit there and analyze and hypothesize and theorize all you want. It can almost get you in a state of, like, uh, being immobilized. Because there's so much information and so many seeming potential ways to go. But once you hear the guidance, then it's like very clear. Do this, do that. You feel joyful. Just in following. So what would be the difference to listening to the prompts and listening with the utmost honesty to your own heart? It's the same. It's the same. Does that come back to actually your, your intuition? You yeah. Just listen to your Intuitive guide. Intuitive guide. Your heart. You're just giving it over to really following your heart. Some people say it's the, follow your heart. Some people say follow your gut. I had a gut feeling. Oh, yeah. you can call it anything you want. It's the same <laughs> feeling. Some people it's gut. <laughs> I don't want to follow my gut. But it's like, <laughs> if I follow my gut, I'll be right up at the bakery. <laughs> then I'll be following up the bigger gut. <laughs> <laughs> the Buddha all over again. But, <laughs> so, you know, it's, the words don't matter. We're talking about a, a, a presence here, not, it goes beyond the, the, the semantics, the words that you call it. Yeah. I, I have one more responsive question, actually. Uh, <laughs> can you recall any instance when when you guys in your family, uh, had an impulse to, to say something to the end, but did not say it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? That, that happens. I mean, Daily. actually, we, we, <laughs> 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 that's nice. Oh, yeah, that, that happens all the time. In fact, you know, a lot of people that have come, like our friend Charles I mentioned, you know, he came <coughs> from... He seemed to be beat as a child when he would try to speak something when he was a little boy. They would whip him. And then he went into an institution and another institution. And so he would then, he spent most of his life, he went from a kind of a family where he was beaten into one institution after another, where he was screamed at, yelled at. If he would say anything that wasn't in line with the rules. Uh, so yeah, when he came there, for example, to answer your question, he was... He was very much into uh, holding on to a lot of emotions, a lot of thoughts that he didn't want to share. And the way that he seemed to hold on to it, too, was he was eating. He was, he was eating a lot, he was over, over 300 pounds, um, problem with, with, you know, going to the restroom and testing food and, and, you know, lots of things. First came, he had lots of pills. He was on lots of different medications. But a lot, he has changed. He's only been here since I've been here. A little bit over, only a little bit over a year, and already the all the pills and the medications have kind of most of them have all fallen away. He's very aware that the eating is like a major defense against a fear. Like he's he's covering and protecting that. That's been a major thing, and he's much more willing now to to talk about his emotions. And that's just an example about how when you feel the, uh, the, the allowance, it's allowed to it. Even though you're allowed, the whole fear can still inhibit from people really talking about it. So it takes trust. And I think over the last year and a half, his trust has grown and grown and grown. So he's much more willing to pour it out with anyone, including me. I mean, he, it was a stretch at the beginning where he was very much afraid to pour it out to me. So he would say it here or there, and then he got to the point where he was saying, well, you did this, David, I think this was in fear, or you did that, or this and this and this. Much more freely realizing that there was no 
he wouldn't be, in, he was raised Catholic, he wouldn't be excommunicated uh, for throwing out a certain idea that seemed too threatening. It would just be used, like the rest of the idea. And that, and that works the other way as well, so you guys are also able to be completely honest with him? Yeah. I yes, I he, he is to that, and also I teach that, that you don't go for the jugular of the ego, so um, for example, we did some travels, I think Kirsten, when you first, when Tr Charles first came, you had thoughts about obesity, about diet drinks, and you know, there was just these thoughts that were coming up and everything, and I basically would say, you know, you can't go to the jugular, you know, if somebody's just coming in here and just starting to want to develop a little bit of trust, just like, you know, if a toddler was taking their first steps, you would, you would cheer them on when they had a couple of successful steps. If they fell down, you wouldn't give them a whack and say, How? you should be able to stay on your feet and give the baby a whack, you know. And similarly, when you're working with people, you have to understand how frightened that they are, that they're coming to gently start to work through these ego things, and you don't, I was talking to the person, it's like, no, we're not going to approach the, the food issue with Charles, and actually that went on for some time, where lots of other things were worked with before he came out one day and he said, I got a big issue with food. He, he was probably almost a year. Yeah, yeah almost a year. So during that year you had to curtail how you communicated with him. Is that what you said? No, I was still listening to the, to the inner prompt. In other words, the Holy Spirit, the heart is so gentle. It's not like you're holding back. It's just that the Spirit knows what's best and timing of things. So it was like, I, I saw no problem with it. I mean, in fact, we, we had some friends in California one time that we stopped to stay with them. <coughs> They were just stuffing their face with diet drinks and potato chips and this, this, this. And then, I mean, I had a wonderful time with them the whole time and no problem for me. I mean, the size of a body doesn't mean anything to me. I'm not into pointing out errors. I'm into joining and seeing the Christ. But when we left their house, we came back, Kirsten was like, oh, it was like a major, you had things about. They were there. They were so unhealthy. shared with us a week later was that they felt so loved and not judged when they were there and it was the greatest gift and then they were able to talk about the difficulty that they were having with the food and the drinks and these things so <coughs> it, it has to come up in a gentle way so the spirit can't be addressed unless it's there and there's already that trust yeah. and it was the same with Charles like I had the judgment and I knew that I couldn't speak or say anything about them because I had a charge. 
so it was not for me to say anything or it would come as a tag. So it just has to be exposed for myself because it's all my own healing. And then it's to be patient and be kind and be loving and be supportive until it, it comes up in a way that's safe for the truth. And so, so could, that, that means that you, you were able to express all these very intense feelings to David. Mm. So you found that an appropriate an appropriate way of yeah. being honest yeah. without being hurtful. Yeah. But you have to be honest to someone. Yeah, it's all my my healing. Mm. And that's the greatest the most freeing lesson is to realise I can't it's not for anyone else. I can't heal someone else. I can't fix anyone else. It's I've got the discomfort and the judgment then it's coming up for me to heal and release. So yeah, then it's just using discernment as to who's the most helpful person who can support me as I release this. And so you could tell him that look out he's totally he's got revolt, which is horrific, which is hell on earth, which is dreadful. Oh yeah. You could tell him all. Yeah. 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 Very, very uncomfortable. And the lessons are so full every day, like you went through a thing with our three-legged cat tripod where she, I guess, she tried to put some kind of a, a gel or something on the back of the, the cat's neck, or what was it? Yeah, the back of some, some flea stuff. Some flea stuff. Yeah. And, and when this she... This time it, was, it felt guided, it felt yes, do this, and neither of them even noticed, so I put it on them, and off they went happily, they didn't even notice. And then about three or mo four months later, I had the thought, aha, I need to repeat the dosage. So Kirsten decided to do it. And Tripod, she knew before I even got it out of the drawer, she was all for me to like go and think about it and ran upstairs. You're very telepathic, like <laughs> no way. No, sharp. But Angel, I put it on her and yeah, and she was really upset and she kind of growled and hissed and then she seemed to disappear after that and then we left the house. We went away on a long trip and apparently she walked off from the house and disappeared. And Tripod would just run away to another room after that episode, which was, it was almost like she felt violated, like, like raped or something. Like put, put a gel on the back of my neck without my uh, consent, you know, it was very much. So, so these are like all these nuances, and it's, I mean it's quite dramatically acted out. So when you're really flowing with the spirit and following the prompts, it's just like this ease. Everything flows with this beautiful ease. And when you get into the ego resistances and you try to do it, you know, in an egoic way, then, you know, it's good that it's brought up to your intention, you know. It's, it's not seen as a bad thing at all. You know, it's just all used to, to become a better listener. With total relationship has in my life, and I basically just handed all my relationships over to the Holy Spirit, and I said, okay, these were all set up for ego motive. I could tell that it has some love in them, but there was also some guilt and some fear in all of these relationships. So I basically just handed all of my relationships over to the Holy Spirit, and I had to let go of all of them hand them all over and say, okay, now you bring them back, if they're supposed to come back, in terms of purpose, in terms of serving your purpose. And also, if you want to bring me any new relationships, then of course, you know, this is what the whole point of it is. So a lot of the relationships that I had in my life that were very much based on, on the past, on genetics, you know, like when you're a child, I don't know some of you what your family life was, but we were always visiting relatives, you know, relatives, 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 genetics, DNA, you know, the, the, the kin, the, the meeting of the kin, always doing it in kind of ritual, special days, holidays. In the United States, we have a holiday called Thanksgiving, and, uh, and so, this, we would always go to meet with the relatives on Thanksgiving. They always have a whole afternoon full of football games. So the men all sit around and watch football games all afternoon. And the women sit and they cook the food and they, you know, have their catch up on the latest gossip and everything. It's like year after year after year, Thanksgiving, you know, 
or the ritual around Christmas with presents. You know, it's the same kind of rituals, but these are all based on past associations. And when you really hand your relationships over to the Holy Spirit, uh, things are going to seem to shift even in your in your perceptual world because you know you're asking more, what is it for? Is this the best use of my time on this one day of the year called Thanksgiving to sit here for for six hours and watch football games? And you know, it's like no. Even though when I started to break out of the pattern, I would get you know, well, where are you? Why aren't you, why aren't you coming? You know, that you're expected to fit into these patterns and norms. But when you start to follow the spirit, it's like no. It's what's the most helpful use of my time? And then also your circle of friends can change. Um, instead of based on things like uh, reunions or family reunions that are very much like rituals of, of patterns of behaviors or with schoolmates or friends that you met, knew or met from your business associates or work and so on and so forth, you start to realize that, that those were all based on ego's belief in getting, and when you hand all of that over to the Holy Spirit, again, the relationships that will show up in your life, if you're very open and flexible, will start to reflect your core spiritual values. So this is really the essence of how spiritual community, in a helpful sense, unfolds. It's really not organized in the sense that it's not like you have to just go and sign on the dotted line and join some order or some organization. Like priests and monks and nuns have tried to do, just go give yourself over to the convent or the monastery, which could still have the same old patterns, ego patterns, acted out in the monastery or in the convent. But, but this is a very spontaneous kind of a vibrational way of looking at, at relationships. For me, I went from being very shy, uh, I had a very, very small little circle of friends in, uh, in school, in uh, grade school, very small, junior high, very small, and in high school, very small. When they had the day when they were going to publish the yearbook and do the senior superlatives, most athletic, most popular, class clown, most likely to succeed, and yes, we did have most quiet. I was voted most quiet of my, in my senior class, and uh, I did talk to my close circle of friends, and, and even my close friends, they said that we voted for you, and I said, I talk to you every day at lunch, and everything, and they said, oh, you know, you're famous, you're popular now, you're, you've been voted something. <laughs> You're most quiet, you know, it's like, is this supposed to be a, pop a good distinction to be the most quiet? You know, I couldn't see the benefits of such an, an honor <laughs> getting in the yearbook as most quiet. But, but you know, it, again, those are the, the, the past associations that, that we had to let go of. And then, and then as years went on and I got into the course and began traveling and sharing and speaking, and I developed reflections or friendships all around the world, but they were, they were based on this purpose. Uh, me showing up to just share the joy of God, and, and them showing up in my life just to share the joy of God. And it didn't so much matter, we didn't really have a lot of past commonalities or, or interest in the past. These people were from many countries, many cultures, they spoke many different languages, many more languages than I speak. And it all was based on this vibration of, of love, or this purpose that, that we're given. To forgive the world is really our purpose. To let our perceptions become integrated and whole, so we can see the big picture. That's the whole purpose of this world, is to see a unified perception. And then, as we get into this purpose more and more, we just let the Spirit bring into our awareness the people that help us along the way, that help, help us serve this purpose. And uh, it's not based on, on anything in form. It's based entirely on a, an intuitive vibration. So that's why I talk a lot about vibrational relationships, because those relationships are reflections of your divine purpose that you have in your mind. 
and there, that's why this, it's a party, it's a celebration. There's no guilt, there's no shame, there's no sense of, um, of like uh, fitting into a role. Uh, even like my biological father and mother both, when I got my mind into this vibration, into this purpose, they turned around and my biological mother went from seemingly kind of stern and controlling and uh, my father, biological father seemed to be very, very angry. Uh, I call them like Cupid dolls. They just, ping, they were just like, hey, here's the new, the new uh, Evelyn and Jack. Uh, I, I didn't even call them uh, mother and mom and dad from this new perspective because those were just roles from the past. And I call everybody by first name, so it's like, well, I make exceptions with mom and dad. When I first did it, my biological sister, her head about snapped. And she was like, what did you call them? You know, and I said, Jack and Evelyn. She was like, what? You know, but then it, it came out so naturally, it just was time. And then after that, it was always Jack and Evelyn. And it was more like we were just meeting in the joy of purpose with no, nothing from the past. Nothing, no expectations, you know, of what could have been better, could have been different. Like, I release you completely from the role. And I release myself completely from the role. And we meet fresh and clean in this instant. Completely born again, completely in a brand new birth uh, from this purpose. And it's very joyful. Suddenly they got very happy. <laughs> After years of being miserable, of life. Couldn't believe it. Happy parents, but they weren't my parents anymore. They were, they were just Jack and Evelyn. So, when you can start to practice that and do that with everyone in your life, it seems like these past association that are genetic or that are biological uh, or that, that are long-standing relationships, they seem to be a little more difficult. But the more you get into the joy of your purpose, you see that there's no order of difficulty in miracles. And it can't be any more difficult to, to release parents than anybody else. It just takes willingness to do it. And then all of a sudden, bing, they spring into a new reflection just from the willingness to, to shift. So, spiritual community has been an idea that has come up. And I, coming here to Byron Bay, uh, having read emails years ago of the, the academy that they had here and and all the things that seemed to go on and, and I know Ted or Hector, um, I visited him a number of times at his, at his home and I know, um, I think, uh, one time, I think the first time, first or second time I came to Byron Bay, I went on, there's a woman here called Lois Hunt who has a, uh, uh, show and I went on with her and I was talking about A Course in Miracles and my life and so on and so forth. And when I went over to uh, visit where I was going to be staying with Robert, um, his partner then, Jackie, had uh, had heard me on the radio and we went out to uh, I think had some had some lunch or something and she just had a sharp reaction. She actually came to one of the sessions. And she went, oh my God, here we go again, it's Hector all over again. <laughs> Another Hector has showed up. And, and I, of course, knew of Hector and knew of Ted and everything, but I could see uh, that, that it was just the past. And she was just seeing the past in, in this body of somebody else because she had associated Hector with being a Course in Miracles teacher. And she had put the David character in the same box. And so it was like, you know, lesson number two all over again. I have given everything I see all the meaning it has for me. So even though I, I was just talking in a gathering like this, she had all this rage that came up, seemingly directed at this body, but we were able to work through it and, and work into a release of it because it had nothing to do with anybody in particular. It's just this ego rage, like the ego is raging at God, wanting to have its fantasy land earth and this world made real. And God is not going to be God if God grants reality to the fantasy land. So the ego rages and thinks that if it rages long enough that after so many millennium, God's finally going to get worn out 
You know how you do that as a child. You throw <laughs> enough tantrums, just keep throwing them, and throwing them, and throwing them, that eventually the parents will just go, all right already, <laughs> go ahead, have your fantasy land. I will grant reality to your dust. And you can have, go ahead, have your illusions. I will give them reality. But uh, God being God, God being reality, pure love, is not going to grant the ego its wish uh, that illusions become true. <laughs> That's, that ain't going to happen. <laughs> so, so then it comes down to us, once you start to realize that God is not going to change God's mind, and suddenly say, okay. I've Seems had enough of your tantrums. I've had enough of your tantrums, and I can't take it anymore. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna grant reality to fear and guilt, uh, just so you know you'll stop. But uh, God's not going to do this. So then you start to realize that whenever you get angry at anything, that there's, it's just by clinging to the ego and holding on to its belief system that's generating the anger. It never has anything to do with. Who said what, and who did what to who, and all the typical dramas of this world. It's just the ego's rage coming up. And the only way to be free of this rage or anger is to dispel or release the ego from your mind. You know, it makes perfect sense. And Jesus, here we are at Easter, you know, that Jesus is just an example or a model or a way shower of one who said, oh, Be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. He says, Satan is underfoot, still using the snake metaphor, <laughs> like a snake is, <laughs> is caught under a foot. You know, it's like it's not going to be causing any more trouble, uh, it's underfoot, you know, I've, I've overcome the world. So just, just to make it a little bit easier for me, is God a metaphor in this discussion? Uh, yeah, in fact, when, when I say the word God, what I have come to experience is that there really is no definition for God. God can't really be described, and even though there are many traditions where we call, you know, God uh, Yahweh, or Jehovah, or God, or Atma, or in the Buddhist tradition, there's really no name at all for deity. Uh, they don't even attempt to, to name deity. Um, we could just say the experience of a spirit, or infinite, eternal, everlasting love. Uh, which there's not really a lot of reference points in this world for everlasting because everything is temporary in this cosmos. Even the stars, you know, the romantic song, as long as the stars shine in the heaven, I will be loving you. Well, now we know they're just burning gases and they're going to burn out. So you have your sophisticated man and woman, they say, is that all? You'll just love me as long as the stars, you know, it's... So God is, is uh, when I talk about God, it's like, I would say um, the word creator could come to mind, but, but we're not talking about the creator of the heavens and the earth even, so we're not even talking about a, a God that's described in Genesis, because, because spirit is what creation is. The spirit is eternal, and this cosmos is, is temporary, it's ephemeral, it's perceptual. Even in quantum physics now, they're saying that, that they've gone down and that most, when they get into the atomic, subatomic level, mostly it's just space. That matter isn't even solid. So it's like everything seems to be pointing to something that's beyond definition. So when I say the word God, I'm not attempting to uh, say a word that, that has uh, meaning or a definition or that even could be successfully described uh, with words. So if I... Uh If I'm in serious discussion, if you'll never use the word God, is that okay? Sure. Sure. I mean, I, I actually go to a lot of different places and they say, <coughs> I usually will say to them, um, well, is there a word that, that you're comfortable with? And some people will say, just love or energy. Scientists will say, how about energy? I say, yeah, that's good. Let's use energy. Or as long as we're not talking about like, like finite, like electricity, nuclear energy, solar energy. You know, all, all the associations we have in this world for energy don't even, even uh, come close to it. Uh, love, everybody, when they think of love, you know, I love, I love my football team, or I love my wife, or my, my children, 
I love my country, you know, even the word love is so watered down with worldly meanings, and it's the same with God. Uh, there's so many meanings of God, you know, our God, people get into a war and they say, God is with us. Well, the God that I'm talking about doesn't take sides in a war, you know, doesn't say this group, I'm rooting for this group uh, instead of that group, you know. So yeah, it's, it's possible to say um, that I've actually been told that I've been invited to Arab Emirate estates over there in the Middle East and that was one of the preconditions. It's like, David, you can come over, just don't say the word God when you're over here at Arab Emirates and States, or, or Jesus, or whatever it is. So, uh, what we're doing here is we're going for an exchange of ideas and an experience in which we want to go beyond the words, beyond the semantics, because everybody has different charges on certain words and semantics. So we're going for a heartfelt experience of, of joining and connection of oneness that uh, we're just going to use the words in the best way that we can. And with certain words people will have reactions. Like I know all my life I've had reactions to certain words as well. So just, so just, just to clarify then, then uh, what motivates you to use the word God in that case? Because what you just said in the last five minutes effectively say that there is no definable entity that can be encompassed by the word God. So why use it? I mean you may have a very, very good reason. I'm just I'm just yeah, uh, curious. Curious to this kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I it's interesting. I've traveled in twenty one countries and depending on where I seem to be and who I seem to be speaking with, uh, the words come out in different ways. I mean, I've had people ask me if I'm a Christian, or a Buddhist, or a Course in Miracles teacher, or so forth, and there's nothing that comes out, uh, in a sense, consistently, because the words must come and be used in particular settings that just are given. Uh, I don't select the words. Uh, nothing in my life is, is personal in the sense that um, uh, somebody said, do you make notes before you give these talks around the world? No, I never have, have any notes. I never have a clue of what will come out. It may come out one way on one day or night and come out a completely different way on another night. Uh, there is no consistency, nor do I teach that, that consistency can be found in words or in the world. But my state of mind is consistently happy, and people can feel that. Uh, I've had people that have come to my gatherings and they will say, uh, you don't even want me there. Uh, I said, what do you mean? You're, you're invited. It doesn't matter whether you're atheist or you believe in pink pyramids or, or God, Jehovah's, or whatever religion or non-religion or scientific. I, I'm really at a stage now where I, I no longer hold on to any specific beliefs. So, so for me, I'm in an ex a state of mind and an experience where nothing is an interruption and nothing is out of bounds in terms of, of words or discussions. It's a state of non-judgment. So I, I include everything and everyone in my state of mind. And I recognize that my state of mind includes the entire cosmos. So, so do I have enemies? No. Do I have um, anybody, some man said one time, he said, you don't really want me to come to your gathering this afternoon because, because I will disrupt your gathering. And I said, disrupt? How could you possibly disrupt a gathering? And he said, well, believe me, with the stuff I'm going to say, I will disrupt your gathering. And I said, I don't even believe in disruptions. I don't, I don't believe in interruptions. Nothing. Whether it's cats racing around here or people standing up and saying, Praise to Ayatollah or Saddam or whatever, you know, that I wouldn't consider that a, a disruption. Uh, I don't believe in disruptions and interruptions. So, so what that is, it's a, it's a spirit where I trust that everything that will seem to happen is happening in, for a reason and for a purpose. And therefore, uh, it's all unified. I don't really, I don't see good elements and bad elements in situations. And, um, 
I just take the words that are given me to speak spontaneously at any given moment, and, and even times when I show up and others do the speaking, it's perfect too. I don't see myself as, as the speaker or as the one who's leading anything. I don't believe in leaders, I don't believe in followers. It's just the state of the present moment is what I call it. If I may just say, say so, I, I have a fascination with some words, like God, Jesus, purpose. To me, they all indicate uh, an invitation at its best, at their best. An invitation to hold on to something, to cling to something, to not let go of it something. For instance, purpose. Was I to let go of purpose, the bottom would open up, the floor would disappear. I can't, no way can I let go of purpose. It's like letting go of hope. So that's why I'm inquiring about this purpose. Yeah, and even like purpose, for example, the, I did a talk one time in Florida where I, it actually it's a little canister like this with a blue bottle cap, and I spoke, you were probably there for that one, it was like for two or two and a half to three hours I spoke about a blue bottle cap. I said, let's, let's undo the entire cosmos with the blue bottle cap. And I said, this is just an image, just an image. Now, it's only the ego, I would say, that, that pulls it out from the hole, out of a tapestry of images, almost like a giant um, quilt, pulls it out and gives it a name, call it blue bottle cap, gives it a texture, you know, we got little ridges on the side, very smooth on the top, a little thing in the middle there, and then uh, we could talk about the content, you know, being plastic, and the only thing that makes this seem like a blue bottle cap is the past. Uh, in the present moment, there is this state of wonderment where anything that you look upon, you look upon it as if you're seeing it for the very, very first time. There's no past reference point. There's no attachment to it. You talk about the, the floor falling out, yeah, if, if you removed purpose, as you were just saying, if I, if I let go of purpose for this, as it seems to be in this world, the whole universe would open up just from letting go of purpose of this one thing. What's the purpose of a blue bottle cap? People would say, uh, to keep the water in this thing. But what's, what's water? Uh, well, you know, and you could relate it to it, and, uh, and what is it that's holding this, this plastic thing, uh, a body? It would just, it was almost like a, it's a whole bed of lies, like, Everything in this cosmos has been learned, and if you let go of thinking you knew what any one thing was, you could spring into what I call joy and happiness and love, because you simply would not have any clue of what it is. And I've done many teaching sessions in different countries where we will take a chair or a blue bottle cap or something, and we will together go go for that dropping, that releasing, that letting go of, of purpose for it. And then the other word that I use, I use purpose in another context, is that very state of mind that doesn't know what a blue bottle cap is, I would call forgiveness. It's still an illusion, because in reality there's nothing to forgive. Perfection doesn't need to forgive anything. But it's just, it still involves images, but it's just the state of like, wow, I see the whole thing in its entirety, and I, and I don't have any clue about fragmenting it, or breaking it up, or giving it separate names, <coughs> and separate purposes. So yeah, that's, it's beautiful. I, I agree, if, if you could drop purpose in relation to anything or everything in this world, which is the same, then, uh, Everything that that is would be uh, opened up or be held. That's my experience. I was in university for ten years. I had to unlearn every single scrap, everything I learned in university, to be happy. It's like the saying, um, "I can say the universe in a grain of sand." It's 
also why I have no opinions. Uh, people ask me my opinions all the time on politics, political leaders, spiritual leaders, spiritual books, the weather, the ozone layer, and this and this. I have absolutely no opinions about anything. Um, is that a detriment? No. I, I find that uh, that's essential in happiness, to not have any opinions. I do not get into arguments with people. I mean, it's like there's nothing for me to argue about. Uh, I have, there's nothing that I'm for or against in this world. I was sharing yesterday with the group uh, that I went to Argentina when the first Persian Gulf War, so to speak, broke out. And this young man, his mother had given me his, his room to stay in, and, and he, he had said, uh, he was very angry, he said, how long will the bush lovers uh, be, be staying in my room? And so I went to bed, and the next morning I greeted him at breakfast, and I, I said, I heard what you said last night. Well, I'm glad you did. And, and I said, uh, that's not entirely true. He said, I'm a Saddam lover too. And his mouth just dropped about three inches, and he said, my, my God, what have I got here at the breakfast table? I, I don't think he expected that. And well, we had some wonderful discussions, and and now every time I go back, he's happier and happier, and uh, you know, we're just kind of in a state of union. But it started off with how oh, long will the bush lovers be living, staying in my room? And it happens a lot when you really don't hold an opinion, uh, then you can be very friendly. Of course, you can be friendly to the animals, to the plants, to the people to everyone that you encounter, but you certainly have no investment in uh, being right about anything or, or promoting a point of view or you know, something like that. And so with this talk this morning, I just thought we would throw it out as spiritual community uh, as, a, as a starting point, as a topic. As I said at the very beginning, the goal is to feel that the entire cosmos is your spiritual community, and that you are literally in communion with everything and everyone, without exception. And that's it's a very high goal, but uh, I would say completely attainable. I would even use the word inevitable. Uh, resistance is futile, <laughs> that, that it's like the inevitable point of, point of experience is connectedness. Is that also to be understood like a kind of a preference for happiness? No, nope. happiness is a reality, it's not a preference. Only in this world does it seem to have an opposite, but not, it does not have an opposite. This is a world of opposites and multiplicity, so we have things like happiness and depression and joy and anger and so on and so forth. But, but the happiness of this world as an alternative or an opposite to something else could be seen that way, but not the way I'm using the word, I'm using it in kind of absolute kind of a sense. That's a good synonym for God, happy. <laughs> happy is another, another word that would be more, maybe it's more emotional, it doesn't seem to have so many connotations of oh, a man with a long white beard or you know, something like that. So it's what you inevitably drop into when you let go of the blue bottle cap and tie. Yeah. And uh, we were talking like Kirsten <coughs> and Jason over the past, you know, even the past year, it's been what seemed to be a surrender of, of having a life of their own or a life of an individual person to opening to this idea that all that I have, all that I give, all that I extend is all that I am. Uh, it, it's like letting go of the concept of ownership, letting go of the concept of private. Uh, you know, there's a lot of concepts that seem to get in the way of just being who you are. And the point is to first just recognize a concept as a concept and then kiss it goodbye, you know. It's like, oh, I have no need to maintain this concept anymore. It takes too much energy to defend this concept, to protect this concept. You know, it's, 
it's quite a joyful journey just to start to realize that, that you are not bound and limited by concepts. That, that if you seem to have them, you can let them go. But you know how they say it with possessions. It's like they say, do you have the possessions or do the possessions have you? We all know what that feels like when you seem to have a car and a body and a house and a family and so on and so forth. It can seem to require lots of energy to maintain those identity concepts. And what I'm saying is, it's possible to just be free of those and, and recognize that, that those concepts, those possessions are not who you really are. That's another thing I don't have. I don't have opinions and I don't have any possessions. So, they take these socks from me. Yeah. I need some socks. <laughs> uh, it does. You don't. There's not. A, there's not a house to possess. There's not a car to possess. There's not a name to possess. I mean, I go to different countries, and and people come up with nicknames. Um, some of them can seem to be in this world positive names, and some of them quite uh, <laughs> derogatory. Uh, South America is sometimes. What is it they call me? Uh, Maestro. Maestro, sometimes maestro, and sometimes gringo. Uh, <laughs> but they're the same to me, maestro and gringo, uh, because they're just concepts. So in a state of mind of oneness, or, or connectedness and joining, then you don't take any of the concepts seriously. They can say whatever they want to say. So really no they. So that's, that's like a good springboard. Uh, for our topic today, because I think some have expressed that they would like to open to an idea of like spiritual community and can we explore that more deeply and what does it actually mean? You know, how is it valuable? I want to do that. Okay. Our, my experience of spiritual community was that uh, people use it for all kinds of things, as well as the, purpo the, the purpose for which it was established. And the purpose for which it was established, well, who decides that? Unless the Holy Spirit has decided it, and, and it's, all, it's all happening as part of a, an orchestrated plan for the Holy Spirit to, to, to use as a way of speeding up the process of complete reunion. Yes, I think you could speak directly to that in the sense that I think a word that often gets applied or labeled onto spiritual community in this world is cult. Sure. And what I've done is I've simply turned the tables on everything and said, well, let's, if we're going to talk about a cult, and I've had people that have asked me to come on to groups online and message groups, and to make a definitive statement. Is this group a cult? They yeah, actually, right. years ago, said, David, is this group a cult or not? Because some of the people said, we are not a cult, and some of the people said, you are a cult. And so, I said, well, let's just look at cult thinking. <coughs> cult thinking involves fear. Cult thinking would involve hierarchies, uh, protections. Um, it usually involves inferior, superior kind of things, and uh, leaders and followers, and so forth. And I went through all the different uh, aspects of cult thinking. And then I said, now look, could you apply this to the whole world that you see, actually, and it's like, oh, that's a kind of a, a phenomenon. The world's a cult. The world's a cult, yeah, that's exactly it. I, I would say the world, through a distorted perception, of fragmentation, in that definition, the world's a cult. So how could you have a cult within a cult? You know, it's like, why would you point a finger at any brother or sister or group and say that they're a cult, when the entire world, as you know it, is a cult? Now that gives it a much broader context, because then it would seem that if you still belong to this world in any way, shape, or form, then you would need deprogramming. <laughs> to, use, to use cult uh, terminology, if we're going to talk about it that way. And then let's let's be about that. Uh, let's be about that deprogramming from... Excess counseling from the world. 
From the world, yes. Exit counseling. Extra, <laughs> talk about external authorities. Well, how about the Pope? How about the presidents? Uh, the kings, the queens, the princesses? You know, mom and dad, police officers, Boy lawyers. Scout. Boy Scouts, anything. <laughs> Boy Scouts are a <laughs> right, right. Anything, anything that, that fits into those parameters then becomes, uh, you need deprogramming from, from. And so that's what I've had so much fun with, is because when I've gone around the world and they try to have me point out, it's like asking Jesus back then, you know, they caught the woman in the act of adultery. The laws of Moses say, one of the Ten Commandments is, Thou shalt not commit adultery. So there's the law. It's supposedly from Moses by a God. Oh, yeah. And here comes Jesus, and they get the woman. Now they've got her, they caught her in the act, the, the group of men, they grab her, they drag her before Jesus. And they've got their stones ready, you know, to really, you know, apply the punishment for the transgression against God's law. And, and Jesus said, the famous, let he who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. Okay, that really cleared the room. That dropped, all the stones dropped <laughs> right away. Because they were like, they weren't sure, but what if this guy really is from God? <laughs> and he's making this statement in front, of, in front of God, in front of everyone. All the stones dropped, and then... The oh, yeah, some, of them, some of them brought this, you know, tried... And he was writing in the sand yeah. while, they, while they came up. And yeah. when, when, when they saw what he'd written in the sand, <laughs> then, then they put the stone down. Then they dropped the stone down. And then when all the men leave, then the woman comes to him and says, Lord, what, what do you say <laughs> for me? And he says, and I condemn you not. Oh, overturning everything. They had even caught her in the act. I condemn you not. Go your way and sin no more. Go your way and stay in a tune with what is. With with life, with God. So, so what a beautiful teaching. That's the same teaching about when you forgive someone, you forgive them for what they have not done. It's not like they didn't catch her in the act. It's not like they didn't have eyewitnesses and accounts of, of what she did. And what she did certainly seemed to be a violation of the Ten Commandments. And they were certainly looking for punishment. And he was saying no. Because there was a presence there in the scene, the whole scene, that was without sin. And that was the Christ. We could call it the Christ, you could call it universal love, whatever you want. And the Christ would be casting no stones. The Christ will be condemning no one. Because if everything is truly connected, which quantum physics is now showing us, it's called entanglement, what the scientists call it. But if everything is is truly kind of a funny word. Non locality is the other word. But still, entanglement. And he says, I've been living in entanglement my whole life. I'm giving a new meaning to the word. But if everything is truly one, then there's no, there's no casting of anything. There's nobody ca casting out. There's no condemnation. It's like a, a statement that all is perfect and all forever is perfect. And that is really what we're opening up here. You can leave the connotations away from Jesus and Christ and God and so forth and just really feel the love, the unity, the union of that experience, then that's, that's what it's all about. about. Jesus. Jesus was an example of the mystic on the moon. So that's why there are so many reverberations in the world. It was like he wasn't, there was no hiding of that light. He was out there giving sermons, talking, having dinners with people. You know, he was like seemingly a mystic doing what most mystics uh, don't do, uh, is actually moving about through time and space. And he was doing it basically through Galilee. I've been doing it through four continents, more like Krishnamurti. But it's the same thing. It's like, it's not so much in the words that are spoken, but it's just in the presence of saying that this state of mind is available. And it's, it's very natural, and it just requires a lot of willingness to trust and, and follow the inner guidance and to let go of those ego thoughts that would say, you, you know, you're going too far, you know, you're going to be completely... There's beasts out there. <laughs> There's beasts. <laughs> There's beasts out there. Don't leave, don't leave the safe haven of the familiar 
and wander off into the unknown or to, into the big question mark. But I've just talk about how the big unknown and that big question mark is, is not a vicious thing. It's, it's love. <laughs> and the world is the belief that if, if there were no rules and regulations in this world, that all would be chaos. That's why we have prison systems and legal systems and so forth, layers of that kind of stratification. But what I've found is that if you remove all those concepts and legal systems and all that control and order, Love is all that there is, and so I don't, I go around thinking I have, I, I am not of this world, and, and I, am, I am under no laws but God's, so I go, I don't go around like running stop signs and traffic lights, and actually when I'm in South America, they do that anyway now, yeah. there, so, uh, but, but, but happens, right, <laughs> I got picked up in, in Argentina, and, and the woman who picked me up, had a little bit of fear, but she ran like 27 red lights in a row. And I, I, I thought about some of these other civilized countries, how people feel guilty if they go through a yellow, and she's like, boom, boom, <laughs> 27 in a row, you know, like, really no sense of, of law and order. But, um, but actually what happens, the more you train your mind, vibrationally, you do transcend the need for these kind of rules and regulations so that you can kind of flow with the spirit so you're not actively going around trying to break uh, rules and laws, but you're demonstrating the, the highest law or you're, you're demonstrating the only law, which is the law of love, you know, that giving and receiving are the same. That as you sow, so shall you reap, and as you sow love, you will receive that love you know, immediately, so that's like a continuous state of flow, right, from the source. 